Last week we read just four verses uh, from the fifth chapter of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. And uh, it was verses 14 through 17. Uh, Even though we ended on 17, I really began there because I see it as the crux or the turning point in this passage. (coughs) And then we work backward from 17, 16, 15, 14 to understand the context and the amazing point about God's grace and the scope of salvation that Paul is getting to. Uh, Today, we're going to reread, look again at verse 17, but this time we're going to move down to the end of the chapter. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And uh, you'll notice I'm not going to look down at the passage until we get through verse 17. Because if you didn't miss last week, there's a couple of different ways verse 17 is translated. So what I'm going to do is just give it to you in what's called the wooden translation, word for word, what it says in the Greek over to English. And then with verse 18 through 21, uh, I'll pick up with the NRSV translation, which is one of the ones that we have uh, out in the, the pews. But here is verse 17, just word for word. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, new creation, old things gone away, behold, new things here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. And so we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him sin, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us in the midst of worship. And I pray that that uh, same spirit would be (coughs) speaking or whispering uh, to all of us this morning to remind us that Vacation Bible School is not just for children. It's for the grown-ups as well. As we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, 16 years ago, I arrived in the Northern Neck for what was formally called my invitation in view of a call to be the pastor of Minokin Baptist Church in Warsaw, Virginia. Some of you have heard of it? <laughs> few of you. Uh, let's call it what it is. It's a tryout week. And uh, during that five to six days that I was here, uh, two sermons, a Sunday morning and a Sunday night sermon, I got to do a Bible study, and of course the professorial side of me gets giddy about that. So it was a Bible study, not about a passage from the Bible, but walking us through how we ended up with these 39 books we call the Old Testament, these 27 books uh, we call the New Testament. And then uh, one of the other parts of the week that I really enjoyed was Peyton Balderson and Billy Peyton uh, would take me around during the afternoon to visit some of our homebound uh, members. Um, I really enjoyed that week. It can be stressful on the candidate. It can be very stressful on the church. Um, I remember enjoying it, and I I actually recall only getting anxious or nervous one time, and I thought I was already past all those kind of feelings, but nothing can make you more anxious, no matter how confident you think you are, than giggling teenagers. (laughs) And during that Sunday morning sermon, in a line uh, beginning up there where Ellie and Anna are and going down to about where Jaden and Waverly are, it was all teenagers. And while I was preaching, I heard some snickering, and I'm starting to second-guess myself. Well, 
what's going on up there. And I, I think that I would have kind of held on to that about what, what was happening with all that, but I soon became friends with a fellow named Aaron Van Landingham, and he let me know after I moved here that they were all just laughing because they were trying to decide if I looked more like Jim Carrey in Ace Ventura or Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Maybe I look like the Ace Ventura one and act like the Dumb and Dumber. I, I don't know. It was uh, an enjoyable week. Now, you had a lot going on in the church other than just a preacher there for a tryout. Do you remember? The Sunday before had been your graduate recognition Sunday that year, and a young man named Jackson Morris had just finished high school, and he was one of the speakers that you had on that Sunday in the middle of June. And because being 18, thinking you don't want him to have to fill up the entire time, a young lady who had already been at college for one year, Afton Jenkins, came and decided to also uh, speak on that Sunday. And because it was June, you all were in the middle of getting ready for vacation Bible school. I think it was going to start right after uh, I was uh, leaving. And of course, I'd be moving here uh, to much of your chagrin, it seems like permanently, <laughs> a few weeks later. And uh, I remember getting on that plane to fly back to Texas thinking, ah, I wish I could have stayed that extra week because I love Vacation Bible School. Not just for the children, but Vacation Bible School is a time when all the different generations of the church uh, work together. And when we really see that with a lot of Christmas activities, maybe Easter activities, but uh, Vacation Bible School is important. Uh, because if, if children are fortunate enough to have, and I don't have to worry about embarrassing him because he and Jane left, but Earl is a wonderful children's Sunday school teacher. And to know that our little ones hear about the love of Jesus and God's grace from him is a blessing. And then you add having a gifted teacher like that for the children along with Vacation Bible School, that is a chance for the children to hear from us or maybe just spend time from us and know what it is to be part of a church family, to participate in God's community of grace that he has placed here at Minokin. I have vacation Bible school memories from when I was a little kid. You have to remember, until I was 13, my daddy was the preacher. And during vacation Bible school, that's like being one of the president's kids. <laughs> and so I remember the crafts, and my mom and dad even had a cedar chest for a long time that I think they only sold about five, six years ago. But my mom had kept the crafts I had made in vacation Bible school in that cedar chest. I think they're up in their attic now, probably melted in the West Texas sun, but she held on to those things. And lo and behold, Hannah had just turned 11 years old when I moved here. And so we had loaded up all of her things that she had from Waco. And I'm going to have a couple of visual aids this morning. I still have, can you see these handprints? on here at Downsville Baptist Church in Waco. This is a craft that Hannah had made at a vacation Bible school. By the size of these hands, I'm going to probably say around age six, seven years old. And so these tangible, concrete, literally, things that we hold on to are to remember the special things that took place during that week. All of that brings me to the, this profound passage from St. Paul that we began last week and we continue through, uh, through today. Paul, in this passage, expressing to the Corinthian congregation that they are the ones who understand the scope of God's grace and forgiveness, not just that they as individuals have had their sins forgiven, but that God has made an entirely new creation through what Jesus has done. And Paul is trying to persuade them to remember this or, or maybe to see it for the first time so they can get beyond some of the self-righteousness they hang on to of thinking, oh, well, I'm saved or I'm good with God, but everyone else is lost. And Paul is telling them no. Something much bigger than that 
has taken place. In fact, uh, toward the end of this passage, he even declares that they are all ambassadors. They're representatives for Jesus. And then he uses a word. Again, I'm going to pick on the Greek a little bit today because my translation made this sound too polite. If you heard my translation, it says, we're ambassadors for Christ, and therefore we, we entreat you. We entreat you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. I don't know about you, but how often do you use the word entreat in your daily life? I, I, I don't use it very often. We entreat you. <laughs> Sounds like a polite invitation. No, no, it's the Greek word, do am I. And the better translation, and some of you may have had it, is we beg you. We beg you. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, because this is the gift that has been given. These words from 2 Corinthians 5, if we were to make an album of St. Paul's greatest hits, some of these verses would be there. These verses that say, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. All the old stuff has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Everything, every person, every situation in which we find ourselves, having been baptized in grace, we see everyone and everything differently. And then there's this amazing statement that's made in the final verse, in the 21st verse, not just of an idea that we've heard before of somehow uh, Christ uh, took our place on the cross as a sinner on the cross. It, it's much more bold as the declaration made by, by St. Paul is that Christ became sin on the cross. Not just took the sinner's place, some sort of substitution theory, but Christ became sin on the cross, dying for all of us, bringing all of us into his new life. It finds the Apostle Paul so desperate that this is the one abiding truth. This is the one reality, my friends, that never ends. This kingdom that has been established through Christ's life, death, resurrection, and then the pouring out of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and for us all, that creates a new reality. And boy, do we as grown-ups, we take our eyes off of it. We forget. We get so angry about some of the wrong turns that our lives have taken, that we forget that there is a deep and abiding joy that transcends our current hardships. We get distracted by some of the other things that we can do with life, and we start to partition or compartmentalize our faith of, oh, that's for Sunday mornings, and occasionally I'll think about doing a nice thing for someone. Well, as we go into vacation Bible school, Let's jog our memory, saints of Minokin, and remember that this singular vision, this one reality, this new creation brought to us by Christ is the one thing that abides forever. And when we hold that vision at the forefront of our minds and our hearts, it does change the way we look at everything and everyone couple more visual aids this morning. This is a name that you may not have heard much of. If, if uh, you pay close attention to my sermons, there's no, no, no exams, no worries. <laughs> you, you're going to hear this name and think, I'm, I may have heard that before. There's a case to be made that the greatest teacher in Christendom, the greatest teacher of the church for the modern era, passed away just 20 days ago, on June 3rd. Um, I'll throw the name out there to see if maybe there's a little memory jog for some of you. Jürgen Moltmann. Jürgen Moltmann, German theologian, passed away at the age of 98. He provided two offerings throughout his life to the followers of Jesus that I believe will abide until Christ return one day to claim his church as his bride. Now, if you listen to that age, age 98, and that name, German, 
being a German name, you may be thinking, oh, wait, what's, what's the history here? And it would probably be easy for me to gloss over, but I think it's important. German, 98 years old. Any of you see where I'm going? In 1943, when he was 16 years old, he was conscripted, forced into the Nazi army. A teenage Nazi soldier. And in that forced service was in that German army for about two years before the Allied forces won the war. And Jürgen Moltmann, as an 18-year-old, became a prisoner of war. His life looked utterly hopeless as he was put in a prison camp in Great Britain and his job was to repair much of the infrastructure that had been destroyed. His uh, prison camp, by the way, was in Kilmarnock, Kilmarnock, Scotland. <laughs> and an American chaplain in Great Britain came and brought him one of these little Bibles that was just the New Testament and the Psalms. And Jürgen Moltmann began to read, and in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, he found new life and a new direction. And in the cries of lament from King David in the Psalms, he found a God who could join him in the lower places of life, where life takes all of us from time to time. These two books, written by Moltmann, have so, have so added to the family of faith that is God's children, even if you've never heard his name, you're going to hear his wisdom. In 1967, he published A Theology of Hope. And A Theology of Hope, he revisited something that theologians had given up on years before. Uh, the stuff about the afterlife and Christ's return and all that, it needs to just be a footnote. Don't focus on that stuff. It's mysterious. It's weird. So whenever we talk about what's going to happen in the end times, Make it a couple of pages at the end of the book. Make it maybe just a footnote at the bottom of a page. And Jürgen Moltmann said, no, we're missing out because this isn't just the future that we're hoping whimsically might happen. But in the gospel, Jesus Christ has taken what God's future for us is and placed it in our hearts now. So the theology of hope, hope isn't something to be moved to the end as a wish. But hope is to be the very fruit of the Spirit planted in our hearts that the future vision is here and now guiding us forward to when God will fulfill it completely. And whether we think that this is some sort of happy, happy, joy, joy gospel that doesn't deal with the suffering, we also have his other great book, and there are more than two, The Crucified God. And what Moltmann corrected here was the idea that had been a wide swath or stream within Christian history of people at the cross at Golgotha opposing God the Father against God the Son, that the two were somehow enemies that moment at the cross. And for you young people, I hope that sounds strange and bizarre because except in certain fundamentalist churches, that garbage is no longer preached because Moltmann displayed the foolishness of such an idea of the Father over against the Son. And so Moltmann says, no, at Calvary, at Golgotha, we see a God who loves us so much and is so vulnerable that he himself becomes the crucified God, not letting that death, not letting that crucifixion be the final word of the story, but showing in his divine sovereignty and his determined grace that through the resurrection, he comes back time and time again to claim us all. We grown-ups need a reminder of this vision that is ours because our hearts and minds get cluttered by so many distractions. And I understand we grown-ups have to deal with some heartbreaking, crushing circumstances from time to time. I remind you as we enter this sacred week, there is a bigger vision. There is but one abiding reality. It is ours already, and it is our calling as ambassadors to live with God for one another each and every day.
Remember back in the 2008, 16 years ago when I moved here, we had the big economic collapse and it was, oh, these, these banks or these businesses are too big to fail, and these we can let go, and I never took an economy class. All that stuff is over my head, but that phrase, too big to fail, stayed in my mind. Though God is a mystery of love and grace to me, I do have faith to claim this. God is too gracious to fail. If God has determined that his dream, that his vision for his children is that we abide with him forever, so shall it be. Amen.